welcome to the Nonprofit Show. We are so glad you're here with us today for today's discussion with James Golder, Partnerships Manager at Bloomerang. And James is here to talk to us about turning your volunteers into donors. So he's got some really good insight to share with us. Before we start the conversation, we always like to remind you who we are as co-hosts. So hello to Julia Patrick, as you, if you're watching and not just listening, you notice she's not here today. So we wish her the best and enjoy your day off. She's the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And we have Julia to thank for this amazing broadcast and platform because she had the foresight to say back in March of 2020, hey, I have this kooky idea, Jarrett, would you serve alongside me as a co-host? And I said, absolutely. Although I will tell you, James, I wasn't quite sure what I was signing up for at that time, but I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group. And together we have helped to produce over 900 episodes. Thank you to our amazing presenting sponsors that Bloomerang is absolutely one of those. In fact, one of the spearheading sponsors. So thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Thank you to these companies that believe in us, trust in us, and also pour into our communities and our mission. So if you haven't had the opportunity to connect with these companies, we highly encourage you to do so. If you need an introduction, uh, please let us know, and we would be more than happy to do that for you. All of our episodes are loaded onto a variety of platforms, so there's no excuse to not consume this information, whether you're cooking or exercising or traveling. So you can find us on streaming broadcast, podcast, and also download the app. And in just a couple of hours after our live conversation right now with James, you will get a notification that this conversation is now uploaded in perpetuity for you to binge watch or binge listen to at any time. So. James, thank you for joining us. Uh, again, those of you that have joined us at, at any time, live or one of the recordings, James Golder is here with us today. Back with us, because you've been on several times over the last four years, you serve as Partnerships Manager at Bloomerang. And again, bloomerang.com is the website, so please do check them out. Welcome back to you, James. No, oh, thank you, Jared. It's so great to be here. I always have such a nice time with you. And uh, sorry, Julie is not here, but I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. And I have to tell you, you know, you always come on with these very vibrant shirts, which unfortunately <laughs> you don't have one today. But I, I remember you saying like, oh, yeah, this one's a Kachina or this one, you know, whatever, whatever the shirts are. And so when Julia let me know that you are a guest, she said, you know, the guy that wears the fun shirts. <laughs> And now I just, I have a black Bloomerang shirt on. I, I'm at a conference and yeah. uh, there are a lot of people at Bloomerang who will yell at me if I wear a, a Hawaiian shirt at a conference. So <laughs> at a conference. I, have to, I have to tone it down a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> no, I completely understand. Well, you are at a conference and what you shared with me earlier is you were speaking at the conference, you know, around the same topic. So it's yeah. fresh on your mind, but I also know you eat, breathe and sleep this content anyway. So Let's dive in with, you know, how we can move volunteers into donors. And the first topic we want to have you touch on is this, I'm going to call it a stat, a data point, is that volunteers donate actually 10 times more than those who do not volunteer. That is shocking. T tell us more about this. Yeah, I was stunned the first time I saw this statistic. Um, and yet the more that I think thought through it and the more I continue to think through it, I think it makes sense. Yeah. So these people go to whatever the nonprofit is, they get a chance to see that nonprofit in action. They're seeing the impact unfold all around them. They're seeing the change in the community as they get their hands dirty, as they get in there and, and help uh, in any way that they can. So there's a, a natural connection being forged as they volunteer. So when you then make that pivot and say, hey, you're already donating your time. We appreciate that so much. Would you consider monetary donations as well? That connection is already so strong. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you're not having to sell them as much. You're not having to convince them so much. 
they already know the great stuff that you're doing and they've already said, yeah, I want to support you with my time. So money makes sense too. Yeah. You know, one of the audiences I think of with volunteers, first and foremost, are our board members, right? So Mm -hmm. they are fiduciary agents, but by, I'm going to say by and large, they're often, not always, often one of the most like target audiences that are so invested, right? Like they're leading the organization from a legal fiduciary standpoint and they're volunteers. Absolutely. They're such a great group to get in front of and talk through uh, all of those opportunities. So uh, I would also urge you to talk with them about being a regular volunteer uh, in some other capacity, aside from being just a board member, but also talk with them about the financial contributions as well. So they're, they're, heads down focused on, you know, the staffing and budget concerns and all of that kind of stuff. So getting them in front of the impact that you do, that you accomplish on a day-to-day and week-to-week basis can kind of rejuvenate them a little bit, you know, kind of remind them, oh, that's right. That's why I give so much time to this organization because we're doing so many cool things. Yeah, to really see the mission, you know, in action, not sitting around the board table, which we can still bring the mission in, but that's that's a great example. Talk to us, if you would, so we can better understand what motivates our volunteers, what's driving them to, to give of their time so generously. What are some of these motivations you're seeing? Yeah, so there's a few things. There's been some studies done on this, and and one a couple of things stand out. Uh, I think there are certainly um, emotional and mental health and physical benefits that come from volunteering. So uh, I know that uh, uh, for a personal example, uh, our youngest uh, had a tough time during the pandemic. Um, No, you know, no surprise. Lots of teenagers did. And so we, uh, we decided, my wife and I decided that maybe we'll let her uh, foster some kittens. And it was, so our house is a little bit of a zoo right now, as it has been for the last couple of years, uh, but in a good way. And it really, it really helped her a great deal uh, to have something else to focus on, to, you know, realize, okay, we got to get their weight up because we got to get these little guys spayed and neutered and, you know, gives them the goal and the purpose and all of that. And it was a real boon for uh, her mental health and emotional well-being and all of that, which I think is a wonderful reason to volunteer. Um, And then you have people who want to give back to their community, uh, who maybe have uh, needed some services, needed some help in the past, whatever the situation is, and and they want to be able to give back and uh, contribute somehow. Uh, And then uh, you have people who who just see it as a good civic, uh, you know, duty sort of thing. So there's a lot of reasons why people volunteer. And that's a, it's a really important point to understand why they're volunteering to make sure that you're addressing that and thanking them for that. And then that'll help keeping them come back uh, to to volunteer time after time. You know, that brings up a great point. I'm going to throw you this curveball, but I know you're going to knock it out of the park. When someone expresses their interest to volunteer, is that the time when we ask them their motivation? Hmm. Uh, Sometimes, sure. I I think it depends a little bit on the relationship that you have with that person. So if it's the first time that you've ever encountered them, eh, feel out a little bit. If they're uh, eager and smiling and happy to be there and they're engaging with you, then absolutely. Heck yeah, ask them. If they're a little more reserved, um, they're there could be a million reasons why they're volunteering and you might need to earn that trust a little bit before you try to leverage it. So I, I hate to equivocate, but I, I think that uh, it depends a little bit on what the person is like and, uh, and kind of how you read that situation. Well, and you bring up a good point that even the, the origin motivation might change and evolve over time. I know I've heard a beautiful story with one of my clients that there was an Um, an older woman that was coming to volunteer within the senior program, right? So she's also a senior and wanted to be of service to other seniors. That was her original motivation. But then when she really dug into her volunteer time, she said, you know what? This is benefiting me way Mm. more than I think I'm actually benefiting, you know, the the mission and those that I'm serving. And so hearing that evolution, you know, and you speak to it, James, so beautifully is that, there's so many benefits to volunteering, you know, 
And even though one motivation, again, might be our origin story of what brings us into the mission, yep. there's so many motivations for us to consider and they, they could add up over time. That is such a great point that things evolve. I mean, think about all of our relationships with each other and how they change over time and where you start with something and where you end up halfway through and where you finish, those may all be different and that's okay. That's great. It may be that they get in, they volunteer, they look around and they say, I had no idea the scope of what you do. I came to volunteer with this little piece, but I see what you're doing over here. And I, I want to be a part of that too. And yeah. that's awesome. It's fantastic. Yeah. I want to do that too. I love that. Talk to us about segmentation. So I, I, I feel us going fast through this conversation and we only have 30 minutes right on today's episode and all episodes. So there's a lot to cover, but if you would, why should we, or even should we segment our volunteers? And if we should be doing this, James, how should we go about doing this? Yeah. Um, so yes, yes, you should segment your volunteers. One of my favorite segments is volunteers who have never donated. So if you're able to run that segment, then you can okay. approach them uh, a little bit different than a cold you know, approach where you've never spoken with that person before, because this person already knows what you're doing. They already understand the impact that you're having. If you are able to take it a step further and then also segment by capacity, you can kind of uh, segment out a little bit and approach the people with major gift capabilities a little bit differently. The volunteers who haven't donated, who don't have major donor capabilities, maybe you talk to them about monthly giving. But you're going to talk to them and kind of meet them where they are. You're going to explain the need to them and then give them the opportunity to help that need, whatever the need is. Um, I, I will say that the statistics that I have seen uh, the last couple of years tell me that volunteers are almost uh, universally really well educated. So a lot of them have a master's degree or higher. And they're also, uh, if you look at the, the generational breakdown, and I'm smiling because I'm so happy to say this, uh, the, the generation that uh, is volunteering the most right now is Gen X. Woohoo! So finally, <laughs> we're at the top of somebody's list. We, do, we don't get overlooked for something. I, I can't believe it, but it's happened. So congratulations, uh, right? <laughs> right. You know, finally. Um, so then the reason I bring that up is that that tells us that, again, generally speaking, not true for everybody, but generally speaking, your volunteers are well educated. So they're, again, generally going to be making more money and they're at the, the height or near the height of their earning power. So figure out how to segment out, again, the people who haven't donated but have volunteered, figure out how to segment out the capacity because you don't want to send an email to someone who has the capacity to be a, uh, to be a major donor, an email that says, hey, join our monthly giving program. I want to try to segment that out. But if you can approach those two groups a little bit differently, you're going to have a ton of success, especially if you're wondering, how am I going to get my monthly giving program started? Yeah. This is a great way to do that. So I feel like, you know, and I even hate to say this, like it could be death by segmentation, right? Like there's so many ways we can slice and dice, and you know, all of our data inside of our donor database. And I, I know because I've had my hands in Bloomerang with a lot of different clients, there's some, you know, reports that are already made sure. there. It's like a template report, if you will, or you can start one from scratch. Sure. And again, another curveball, James, but when we talk about segmentation, should we be looking at like three key segmentation areas, specifically in volunteers? Should we look at whittling that down further? Is there like a set recipe for what that might look like? Oh, I don't know that there's a set recipe, but you can be as creative and drill down as much as you want. And it really does depend on the organization as well. So uh, I would start by se segmenting out the people who have volunteered but never donated uh, and then segmenting by capacity if you can, if you also are able to take a look at other areas of engagement. Um, so uh, are they attending events, opening emails? Um, you know, uh, any any other areas that they might be interacting and engaging with you, that's going to help give you a more complete picture of how important you are to them and should help you guide that conversation. So uh, if you think about a school, 
for instance. Um, maybe you have parents who are volunteering. So that's an extra layer of connection that you can address when you segment and break those, break everything down. Uh, so the more, I mean, the more specialized you can do up to a certain point, uh, the better, uh, because you can really craft those messages to, to really connect with people. But like you said, um, everyone's time is is precious and and maybe don't have as much time to drill down as deep as you want. So do what you can. Start with what you can do and uh, and take it from there. I love that. It can seem overwhelming. And I also will say, you know, from experience, once you set these reports up, you can simply change the dates or change some parameters. It's almost, you know, get the recipe, if you will, in place for the report you want to pull and then slightly change it, you know, every so often, depending on what that looks like. One of the things that I've done, and I, if you don't mind me sharing is, you know, I have looked at what, where, where are there volunteers that have not, you know, made a, made a financial donation and then ask them for a very simple $5, $10, $25 donation for oh, one time. Right. Because my goal was we want to move them from a big goose egg to something. Right. And then once they become a financial donor um, on top of that, you know, time donor, then we can start stewarding them in a little different way. Um, so for me, it's like, just something, you know, we just want to move that needle ever, ever so slightly. And it doesn't have to be a thousand dollar gift. You know, I said $5, five, 10, $25, anything like that, I think will really move the needle. Well, very few people are going to start off and make their first gift a thousand dollars. Right. If, <laughs> if you get that celebrate, I mean, throw yourself a party because that's awesome, but it's not going to happen very often. <laughs> not so, very often. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, I, I love that because if you get them in the door and you shepherd them and you steward them and you engage with them well and keep communicating and tell those stories of the impact and all of that, you're just going to deepen that relationship. And, and that's going to allow you to to go back and continue to have those conversations with them. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, right on cue, you said the word story. So how can we best connect with our volunteers using storytelling? So uh, it's really interesting and forgive me in advance because I'm going to, to brag on my oldest child. Um, please, don't, uh, please do. don't, don't tell the rest of the kids. Um, I, uh, I, our oldest uh, lives in Chicago, uh, takes the L train to and from work 45 minutes each way or whatever it is, and uh, reads a lot, a lot of books. So I'm talking about like, 150 a year or so, something like that. Yeah, exactly. It's a lot of books. I'll be lucky if I get 150 in a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, believe me, I totally understand. Here's the bragging part. And again, I yeah. apologize. She is an Instagram influencer for books. Oh. So publishers send her books before they're printed or before they're published and get her to post her takes on Instagram and all that. That's how many books she reads. It's really pretty cool. Proud, That's proud. Really proud cool. Yeah. Um, so I read a fair amount, not, not like that, but I, I read a fair amount myself and we, we send books back and recommendations back and forth every once in a while. It's not every book that either of us reads, but when we, we read something really, really good, we'll send each other a text and say, Hey, you should check this out. I think you really enjoy it. And I started thinking about why that is, why do I send some book recommendations to her, but not all of them and vice versa. And I think it really comes down to character development. So uh, most stories have, you know, some sort of conflict. Uh, there's some sort of change over time, a resolution. I mean, uh, you know, bank heist book or a spy novel or a horror novel or whatever, they're all going to have a loose, you know, some sort of obstacle that needs to be overcome and then some sort of resolution. But the ones that really capture our attention, in my opinion, are the ones with good characters in it. So that's a long way uh, of me getting to the idea that when we're telling these stories to our donors and to our volunteers, we need to make sure that we have good characters in there. And I realize a lot of privacy concerns. We may not be able to name people or show their photos or anything like that. Totally get it. Totally understand. Uh, so make it anonymous or you know change a name, I whatever you come up with. But 
make sure that the stories have the people in them because that's what other people are really going to care about. When you engage your donors and your volunteers with those stories, with the characters that they're going to care about, that's when you're really going to move the needle and see some really wonderful results. Wow. I, I'm just so consumed with listening to this story that you're telling. I'm like, <laughs> what's? I want to turn the page. What's next? What's next? <laughs> I love that. And I'm going to ask a question as it relates to character development, if we could look at it that way through, you know, the nonprofit, I'm going to say fundraising lens and volunteer engagement lens, right? Should we pick a couple of characters and characters I'm using as clients, participants, you know, um, should we pick a, a couple of them and use that same story throughout the year? Uh, mm -hmm. What what does that look like? Because I'm, I'm kind of envisioning, James, if you will, like, let's let's have three stories that storylines that we want to tell. And again, it could be through an animal. It could be through a child. It could be through yep. an adult or an entire family unit. Should we continue building that story through the year or should we pick little vignettes uh, to tell the story through? Yeah. I love the idea of continuing the story throughout the year. I, it's not always going to be practical and it won't always work, but when it does, uh, I think it can be incredibly powerful. So uh, let's think about uh, a Habitat for Humanity that is going to be working with a family on their first home. They've never owned a home before, uh, and their, you know, their kids have struggled because they live in an apartment complex, and it's really noisy, and they're not getting their homework done. And then all of a sudden, they're gonna, you know, so you can tell that bit of the story, and then you can talk about them coming in and working on building that home, and how excited the kids are when they get out to the work site. And then you can talk about, you know, a few months later, how that new home has made such a difference. The kids are a lot more rested, and they're able to do their homework well, and the grades are going up, and all of that. I mean, there's some really, just off the top of my head, some really cool stories that you could tell through that entire process uh, that I think would really resonate and impact nicely with both your volunteers and your donors. Yeah, absolutely. And and I helped a client write a story. Um, their mission truly was child welfare, and mm -hmm. they do it through the vehicle of pet therapy. And so, mm -hmm. if you remember the the Bush's Beans commercial, right, where like the dog is is talking about the recipe for the sure. Bush's Beans, right? Like we kind of took a twist on that, and we had a dog tell his story, his journey, which we had to make oh. it up for the dog. Sure. You know, of here is the day in the life of of my, you know, my life. And I'm always so excited when I get to see Gabriella, you know, and that right. was the child being impacted because it was so precarious around showing photos of the children, telling, telling the actual names, right? And so we switched it and we used the dog as like the story, which was it was really cool. And I have to tell you, like you know, the comments we got back from the recipients of these letters was fantastic. And so we were like, what the heck, let's try it. <laughs> so. I love that so much. And I'm thinking about our youngest fostering kittens. And yes. I'm already thinking, all right, I need to go talk to Cat's Cradle and, and tell them this because they can tell the story from the kitten's perspective of, you know, oh, we're scared in a shelter. And then this, you know, wonderful 16-year-old okay. um, picks us up and takes us home and cares for yeah. us. And oh, I have goosebumps. The whole, exactly. Oh, it's That's fantastic. I love that so much. That's yeah. a wonderful idea. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. You know, volunteers make up a huge component of our community, right? Through uh, the connections and, and all that they provide. And so James, thank you for telling your stories with us here today. For those of you watching and listening, James Golder has joined me in conversation. He is partnerships manager at Bloomerang and joined us from the road because you're in DC at a conference. Is that right? I am. I can see the Washington monument from my, from my window <laughs> right here. It's pretty great. Nice view. Uh, Oh, I love that. Well, this has been fantastic. Uh, every single month we have a representative from Bloomering on, and we're so grateful to have you back with us. And I know we'll have you again. I can't wait to get this story about the the kittens from your daughter and hear hear about that. So thank you for joining us and, and shining light on, on how we can engage our volunteers to become donors. Um, 
another curveball, but do you happen to know how many volunteers there are in our nation right now? Is that a stat that you're aware of? I think I'm doing this from memory. So Okay, sure. We won't hold you to it. No angry letters. But I think I, I saw fairly recently uh, something like seven, 70 million, I think, people volunteer in a given year. It's a wow. lot. A lot. Yep. That is a lot. Yeah. And it's and it's an audience that we shouldn't forget, right? Like, and also not yeah. not take them lightly because they are so invested. They give of their time. They give 10 times more, as we learned, yep. also of their dollars. So thank you, James, for, for bringing this to conversation. Uh, Julia missed a riveting conversation, but I was here for it. It was a page turner. And I just, I want more. Uh, I wish you and I could sit on this L train with your child and go, <laughs> go through more stories. I also want to express my immense gratitude to the entire team at Bloomerang for being a presenting sponsor and to our other presenting sponsors that allow us to continue these episodes marching towards our 900th episode. We'll reach that in October. I know. Thank you also to American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Please check out these companies. You just heard from James here from Bloomerang. Every single one of these companies comes on and shares with us, you know, about what's going on in the sector, what they're seeing um, at conferences and talking with tons of different, you know, uh, nonprofits around the globe, in fact. So, Today has been fantastic. James, thank you for spending your time, especially on the road and fitting us into your schedule. As we end every episode and we have for the last, well, we're in our fourth year, we want to remind all of you to please stay well so you can do well. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. All right. Chat soon. Alrighty.